The Skill of Release, 3. Teachings of Ajahn Lee Damodaro Ajahn Lee Damodaro, for Sudhidham Maransi Gamhiram Dhakariya Compiled and translated by Thani Sarob Hikho Copyright 1999, Jeffrey Degruff Printed for free distribution Beginning Concentration When we practice breath meditation, we've been given methods for warding off the various hindrances that will destroy the good results of what we're doing. We're told to focus on the in and out breath and to keep mindfulness in charge, together with the meditation word, budo, budo, in and out with the breath. If you want just to think budo, you can, but it's too light. Your awareness won't go deep. It's the nature of shallow things that dust and dirt can blow in easily and fill them up quickly. As for deep things, dust and dirt can't easily blow in. In the same way, when the mind is deep, it isn't easily affected by preoccupations. So when you simply focus on budo, budo, it doesn't carry much weight. It's like taking a knife and slicing away at the air. You don't feel much of anything because there's nothing for the knife to strike against. But if you take the same knife and use it to slice away at a stump or any other object, you'll feel that your hand has more weight and your arm gains strength, able to ward off any enemies that may threaten you. This is why we're taught to focus on a single spot so that the mind will gain strength, solid and steady in a single preoccupation. Take as your target any of the meditation objects in the basic list of 40. Your mind will gain strength, your mindfulness will mature into right mindfulness and right concentration. Budo is the meditation word. Being mindful and alert to the in and out breath is the actual meditation. Once the mind is in place you can let go of your meditation word. The meditation word is like bait. For example, if we want a chicken to come our way, we scatter rice on the ground. Once the chicken comes for the rice, we don't have to scatter any more. Being mindful, remembering to stay with the breath, is one thing. Alertness examining the breath sensations that flow throughout the entire body, knowing whether the breath feels constricted or broad, shallow or deep, heavy or light, fast or slow is something else. Together they form the component factors of meditation. The in and out breath is like the wick of a candle or a lantern. Focusing mindfulness on the breath is like lighting the wick so that it gives off light. A single candle, if its wick is lit, can burn down an entire city. In the same way, mindfulness can destroy all the bad things within us, defilement, unawareness, craving, and attachment. Mindfulness is the consuming fire of the practice. Being mindful of the breath is like casting a Buddha image inside yourself. Your body is like the furnace, mindfulness is like the mold. If mindfulness lapses, the bronze will leak out of the mold and your Buddha image will be ruined. Letting mindfulness lapse is like getting a hole in your clothes. Letting it lapse again is like getting a second hole. If you keep letting it lapse, it's like getting a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth hole in your clothes until ultimately you can't wear them. There are three ways in which mindfulness lapses. The first is by bringing inside things out to think about. In other words, you grab hold of any lights or visions that may appear, and in this way your path washes out. The second way is by bringing outside things in to think about, i.e., abandoning your meditation object. The third way is by losing consciousness. You sit there, but it's as if you were asleep. All of these things are called a washed out path, like a road that washes out and is full of deep potholes. To keep preoccupations out of the mind is to cut a path in the mind. To let outside preoccupations in is to let the path wash out. When the path washes out, there's no way that insight or discernment will arise, just as when a road washes out, no cars or trucks can run along it. When concentration gets extinguished in this way, you can't practice insight meditation. There's nothing left but thoughts about insight, thoughts about concentration, thinking, guessing, groping in line with your old preconceptions. The virtues of your heart disappear without your realizing it. If you want to go back and start all over, it's hard like going back over a washed out road. The mind in concentration is like genuine silver, malleable and white because nothing else is adulterating it. 
we can make it into whatever we want, easily and quickly, without having to waste time placing it in a crucible and heating it to get rid of the impurities. The mind not in concentration is like imitation or adulterated silver, hard, brittle, and black, because it's mixed with copper or lead. The more the impurities, the lower its value. A pure mind is thus like genuine silver. The various thoughts that darken the mind are like the impurities that make the silver black, brittle, and dull. So if we let thoughts get mixed up in the mind, we turn the mind into imitation silver. We won't be able to find any purity in it at all. When this is the case, the mind will have no stillness. But if we brush away the various thoughts and preoccupations adulterating the mind, it will become firmly established in concentration, in line with the factors of the path. Once the mind turns into the path, we have to watch over it carefully, in the same way that we try to keep a road from washing out. We have to survey it continually to see where it's getting rutted or forming potholes. Wherever it needs repairing, we fix it right away. If we don't fix it immediately, and let it get full of potholes or wash away, it'll be really hard to repair. Once the mind is following the path, any hindrances that interfere are a break in the road. If we don't hurry up and repair it, the break will get wider and deeper until the road turns into an ordinary piece of ground. So while you're trying to develop the path, if you let yourself be forgetful if you let your mindfulness lapse, letting distractions into the mind the state of mind that forms the path will immediately be destroyed. Your meditation will be spoiled, your concentration will be spoiled, the mind will return to its ordinary state and won't be able to find the path to genuine goodness. While we're sitting in concentration, if our mind doesn't stay with the body in the present, it's as if we've earned some food but don't watch over it. Dogs and cats are bound to come and eat it. The dogs and cats, here, are the five hindrances sensual desire, ill will, torpor and lethargy, restlessness and anxiety, and uncertainty that we like to keep as our pets. As soon as our back is turned, they're going to sneak in and eat up our food the happiness and inner worth that we should have received from our practice. Being lost is better than being asleep. Being aware, even if you have defilements, is better than being absent-minded. If you know you have defilements, you can work to end them. A person who's not aware is dead. If your mind doesn't stay in one place, it's like standing on a lawn. If you stand in ten different places, the grass will grow in all ten places, because first you stand here for a while and then go stand there for a while and then go stand over there. If you don't stay long in any one place, grass will grow everywhere. But if you really stand still in one place, how will the grass grow there? No grass will be able to grow on the spot where the solace of your feet are standing. In the same way, if your mind stands firm in one place, always mindful of the in and out breath, no hindrances or defilements will be able to arise. The path we're following is a shortcut. It's a path worn smooth. Following a smooth path means that there are no weeds growing on it, no obstacles in our way, no need to stop here and there and slow down our progress. The reason we don't yet know how to follow this path is because we don't know how to walk. We walk like people in general all over the world, going forward, turning back, looking left and right. This is why we keep running into one another all the time, falling down, and then picking ourselves back up. Sometimes, even when nobody runs into us, we stagger. Even when nobody trips us up, we fall. Sometimes we get lazy and lie down to rest. Sometimes we stop to look at things we meet along the way. This way we never get to the goal because we aren't really intent on walking. We wander here and there without following the path. So we have to learn a new way to walk, the Buddha's way. What is the Buddha's way? The Buddha's way of walking is to walk like a soldier. Soldiers don't stagger back and forth the way we do. They walk standing up straight, staying in place, stamping their feet on the ground. This way they don't get tired, because they don't have to go far. If we were to walk in place for three hours, the grass beneath our feet would be flattened out. Any grass that tried to grow in its place wouldn't be able to get above ground level. It's the same with the work we're doing right now, being mindful to focus on the breath. 
if we're really intent on it, focusing our attention solely on the breath without letting it wander off and disappear, all the various hindrances thoughts of past and future, good and bad won't be able to reach in to touch us. All the hindrances, which are like grass, will have to be flattened out. No evil, unskillful thoughts will be able to appear in the heart. When this is the case, the mind won't have to follow the paths to deprivation, and instead will keep following the path that goes higher and higher. This is called following the path worn smooth, in line with the Buddha's way. Practicing meditation is like digging a diamond mine. The body is like a big rock, mindfulness is like a shovel. If you don't really dig i.e., if you dig little shallow holes here and there, instead of digging away at one place you can dig for a month and yet get no deeper than your knees. But if you're really intent on digging away at one place, the hole you dig will keep getting deeper and deeper until you get down to the rock. Now, when stupid people hit the rock, they throw down their shovels and run away. This stands for people who practice meditation but can't endure feelings of pain. As for intelligent people, when they meet up with the rock, they keep chipping away at it until they get past it, and that's when they find the valuable diamond that lies on the underside of the rock. If it's a diamond seam, they won't have to work again for the rest of their lives. Gems and diamonds that are really valuable lie deep, so we'll have to dig deep if we want to find things of value. If we don't go far beneath the surface, we'll end up with dirt and sand that sells for only five cents a bushel. When we're true in what we do when we don't stop or grow lax or give up the results, even if they show up slowly, are bound to be great. The fact that they are all growing at once is what makes them slow. It's like a tree with lots of branches to protect itself and give lots of shade. It's bound to grow more slowly than a banana tree, which has only one stem and gives good fruit, but is exposed to lots of dangers. Some people get results quickly, others more slowly. The slower people shouldn't compare themselves or compete with the quick ones. The quick ones shouldn't compete with the slow ones. It's like polishing boards and mirrors. Polishing a mirror so that you can see your reflection in it doesn't take all that much talent, because the nature of the mirror is already reflective. But to polish a board so that you can see your reflection in it, even though it may take a long time, is a sign of real expertise. In keeping the mind pure, we have to cut away perceptions so that they don't stick in the heart. It's like looking after a white sheet that we spread on our bed. We have to watch out for the dust or insects that blow in on the wind and land on the sheet. If we see any dust, we have to take the sheet and shake it out. Wherever there are any stains, we have to launder it immediately. Don't let them stay long on the sheet or else they'll be hard to wash out. If there are any insects, we have to remove them, for they may bite us and give us a rash or keep us from sleeping soundly. When we keep looking after our sheet in this way, it will have to stay clean and white and be a comfortable place for us to sleep. The dust and insects here are the hindrances that are the enemies of the heart. We have to look after our heart in just the same way that we look after our bedding. We can't let any outside perceptions come in and stick to the heart or nibble at it. We have to brush them all away. That way the mind will become calm, free from distractions. Once you cut off thoughts of past and future, you don't have to worry about the hindrances. When you think about things outside, you have to choose carefully what you are going to think about. Think only about good things and not about things that will cause harm. When you think about things inside, though, you can think about anything, good or bad, old or new. In other words, mindfulness and alertness can handle whatever comes their way. It's as if we have our curry in a pot that's tightly covered, where no flies can get to it. Whether it's bland or salty, it's all safe to eat. Thinking about is long. Thinking of is short. You have to focus them both into one when you're making the mind still. Thinking of means that you focus on a single preoccupation. Thinking about means that you examine and evaluate, to see that when you arrange the causes a certain way, what results do you get, good or bad. If you look with both of your eyes you won't be able to see your target clearly. If you want to see it clearly you have to look with one eye, in the same way that when people shoot a rifle or an arrow, they use only one eye to aim. If you make your mind one with its object, 
you will be able to see things clearly within yourself in just the same way. You have to practice concentration in all four postures. When the body sits, the mind sits with it. When the body stands, the mind stands with it. When the body walks, the mind walks with it. When the body lies down, the mind lies down with it. If the body sits but the mind stands, or if the body walks and the mind sits or lies down, that's no good at all. The six elements in the body are earth, water, fire, wind, space, and consciousness. You have to keep familiarizing yourself with them until they become your friends. They'll then tell you their secrets and won't put you in chains or throw you in prison. The mind is like a child. Mindfulness is like an adult. The adult is responsible for looking after the child and taking good care of it. Only then will the child eat and sleep properly, without crying and making a fuss. You have to give the child good food to eat, by focusing the mind on the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Then you have to give it four big dolls to play with, the properties of earth, water, fire, and wind in the body. When the child is well fed and has dolls to play with, it won't run outside and get into mischief. If you let it go wandering outside, all kinds of dangers can happen. But if it stays in the house, even though there are some dangers, they're not all that serious. You have to teach the mind how to play around in the elements of this body, a cubit wide, a span thick, a fathom long. That way it won't get into trouble. Once the child gets tired of playing, it will lie in its crib. In other words, the mind will settle down in Yahana, the resting place of sages. That way the mind will gather into oneness. The Basics of Breathing When the body is still, you gain knowledge from the body. When the mind is still, you gain knowledge from the mind. When the breath is still, you gain knowledge from the breath. Ordinary, everyday breathing doesn't do anything special for you except keep you from dying. The breathing on which your awareness is intent can give rise to all kinds of good things. Ordinary breathing is the breath of suffering and stress. In other words, when it comes in it reaches a point of discomfort, so it has to go back out. When it goes out it runs into discomfort again, so it comes back in. This kind of breathing isn't called meditation. Meditation means gathering all your awareness into the mind. The present aspect of the body is the breath. The present aspect of the mind is mindfulness and alertness. So bring the present of the mind together with the present of the body. The breath is like water. Mindfulness is like soap. The mind is like clothing. If you don't keep washing the mind, it'll get dirty. When your clothing isn't white and clean, it doesn't feel comfortable to wear. Don't put pressure on the breath, force it, or hold it. Let the breath flow easily and comfortably, as when you put a fresh egg in cotton batting. If you don't throw it or push it down, the egg won't get dented or cracked. This way your meditation will progress smoothly. If the mind isn't yet still, just watch the in and out breath without trying to notice whether it's comfortable or not. Otherwise, the mind will start to stray. It's like a farmer planting an orchard, if he mows down too much grass all at once, he won't be able to plant all his trees in time and the grass will start growing again. He has to mow down just the area that he can plant in one day. That's how he'll get the results he wants. Whether or not the breath is even, you have to keep your mindfulness even. The breath is like waves. Mindfulness is like a boat. The mind is like a person sitting in the boat. If the waves of the breath aren't still, the boat will tip or overturn, and the person in the boat will drown or at the least get into difficulties. You have to make your mind still like a boat that has cast anchor in the middle of the sea when there's no wind or waves. The boat won't tip, and the person in the boat will be still and at peace. This is the point where the mind enters the noble path, it's a free mind with full power, released from the sway of the hindrances. The breath in the body isn't limited just to the breath that flows in and out the nose. The breath in the body spreads out to every pore, like the vapor that gets exhaled from an ice cube. It's much more refined than the air outside. When the internal breath goes out the pores, it gets reflected back into the body. This breath is called the supporting breath. 
it helps keep the body and mind cool and still. So when you breathe in, let the breath fill the inside of your body, when you breathe out, let it spread in all directions. When you breathe in, you have to feel the effects of the inner breath in three parts of the body. 1. The lungs and heart. 2. The liver, stomach, and intestines, and 3. The rib cage and spine. If the breath doesn't have an effect all over the body, you're not getting the full results of concentration. Hot breathing is destructive. It gives rise to pain and makes the body age. Cool breathing is constructive. Warm breathing is like medicine. The common breath is like an emetic. The refined breath is like a curative. The intermediate breath is like a food supplement. The common breath is long and slow. The refined breath is short and light. It can penetrate into every blood vessel. It's a breath of extremely high quality. If the breath is heavy, you can keep it in a narrow range. When it's light, you have to make it broad. If it's so light that it's very refined, you don't have to breathe through the nose. You can be aware of the breath coming in and out through every pore all over the body. Wherever there's pain in the body, focus on making the breath go past it if you want to get results. Suppose you have a pain in your knee, you have to focus on breathing all the way down to the ends of your toes. If you have a pain in your shoulder, focus the breath past it to your arm. Breath subdues pain. Mindfulness subdues the hindrances. When we meditate it's as if we were milling the rice grains in our granaries so that they'll be ready to cook. The mind is like grains of rice. The hindrances are like the husks. We have to crack the husks and then polish away the dirty red skin underneath. That's when we'll end up with good, white rice. The way to polish is to use directed thought and evaluation. Directed thought is when we focus the mind on being aware of the in and out breath, which is like taking a handful of rice and putting it in the teeth of our mill. We have to make sure that the teeth of the mill are in good shape. If we're aware of just the in breath and then get distracted with the out breath, it's as if the teeth of our mill were broken. When this happens, we have to fix them immediately. In other words, we re-establish mindfulness on the breath and brush away all other perceptions. Evaluation is being observant, taking careful note of the breath as we breathe in, to see what it's like, to see whether it's comfortable, easy, and free-flowing. We then let the good breath spread throughout the body to chase out the bad breath sensations. All the properties of the body will become pure, the mind will become bright. The body will feel cool and at ease. We have to look after the breath in this way, in the same way that we catch baby chicks to put in the coop. If we hold them too tight, they die. If we hold them too loosely, they run away. We have to gather them in our hands in a way that's just right. That way they'll all end up safely in the coop. When we use directed thought and evaluation, it's as if we polish away the dirty red skin from our rice grains. We'll end up with nice, white rice rapture, pleasure, and singleness of preoccupation. If we take the rice to market, it'll fetch a good price. If we cook it, it will taste good and nourish the body. This is why we should all be intent on polishing the rice in our granaries so that we'll end up with grade A rice. The factors of Yohanna directed thought, evaluation, rapture, and pleasure all have to be gathered at the breath if you want to reach singleness of preoccupation. Directed thought is like laying claim to a piece of land. Evaluation is like planting it with seed. When the seed bears fruit, that's rapture and pleasure. Keeping awareness with the breath is directed thought. Knowing the characteristics of the breath is evaluation. Spreading the breath so that it permeates and fills the entire body is rapture. The sense of serenity and well-being in body and mind is pleasure. When the mind is freed from the hindrances so that it's one with the breath, that's singleness of preoccupation. All of these factors of Yohanna turn mindfulness into a factor for awakening. Spreading the breath, letting all the breath sensations spread throughout all the elements and parts of the body the blood vessels, the tendons, etc. is like cutting a system of connecting roads through the wilderness. Any country with a good system of roads is bound to develop, because communication is easy. If we constantly adjust and improve the breath in the various parts of the body, 
it's like cutting away the dead parts of a plant so that it can begin to grow again. Directed thought, focusing on the breath, is like putting food in your mouth. Evaluation adjusting, spreading and improving the breath is like chewing your food. If you chew it carefully before swallowing, the food will digest easily and give full benefits to your body. The digesting is the duty of the body, but if you want to get good results you have to help with the chewing. The more refined you can make the breath, the better the results you'll get. There are two kinds of evaluation when we meditate on the breath. The first is to evaluate the in and out breath. The second is to evaluate the inner breath sensations in the body until you can spread them out through all the properties of the body to the point where you forget all distractions. If both the body and mind are full, there's a sense of rapture and ease that results from our directed thought and evaluation. This is right action in the mind. One of the benefits from working with the breath is that the properties of the body become friendly and harmonious with one another. We spread the breath all over the body, and then when it grows still it gives you a sense of physical seclusion. This is one of the physical benefits. As for the mental benefits, mindfulness becomes enlarged. When mindfulness is enlarged, awareness is enlarged. The mind becomes an adult and doesn't go sneaking off like an ordinary mind. If you want it to think, it thinks. If you want it to stop, it stops. If you want it to go, it goes. When the mind is well trained it gains knowledge, like an educated adult. When you converse with it, you understand each other. The mind of a person who hasn't trained it is like a child. This kind of mind doesn't understand what you say and likes to slip off to roam around and it goes without saying goodbye. You have no idea what it takes with it when it goes, or what it brings back when it returns. When the breath, mindfulness and awareness are all enlarged, they all become adults. They don't get into spats with one another, the body doesn't quarrel with the mind, mindfulness doesn't quarrel with the mind. That's when we can be at our ease. When you spread the breath as you evaluate it, mindfulness runs throughout the body like an electric wire. Making yourself mindful is like letting the current run along the wire. Alertness is like the energy that wakes the body up. When the body is awake, pains can't overcome it. In other words, it wakes up the properties of earth, water, fire and wind so that they get to work. When the properties are balanced and full, they put the body at ease. When the body is nourished with breath and mindfulness like this, it grows into an adult. When the properties are at peace, they all become adults, the great frame of reference, Mahasatipatthana. This is called threshold concentration, or evaluation. When the mind is broad, wandering after outside perceptions, it loses the strength it needs to deal with its various affairs. Whatever it thinks of doing will succeed only with difficulty. It's like a gun with a broad gauged barrel. If you put tiny bullets into it, they rattle around inside and don't come out with much force. The narrower the gauge of the barrel, the more force the bullets will have when you shoot them. It's the same with the breath, the more you refine your focus, the more refined the breath will become, until eventually you can breathe through your pores. The mind at this stage has more strength than an atomic bomb. Making the mind snug with mindfulness and the breath is like weaving cloth. If the weave is so fine that water won't pass through, the cloth will fetch a high price. If you use it to sift flour, you'll get very fine flour. If the weave is coarse, the cloth won't be worth much. If you use it to sift flour, the flour will come out all lumpy. In the same way, the more refined you can make your awareness, the more refined and valuable the results you'll get. When the breath fills the body, awareness gets more refined. The breath that used to be fast will slow down. If it used to be strong, it will become more gentle. If it used to be heavy, it will grow light to the point where you don't have to breathe, because the body is full of breath, with no empty spaces. It's like water we pour into a vessel until it's full. That's the point of enough, you don't have to add any more. This sense of fullness gives rise to a feeling of coolness and clarity. There are five levels to the breath. The first level is the most blatant one, the breath that we breathe in and out. 
The second level is the breath that goes past the lungs and connects with the various properties of the body, giving rise to a sense of comfort or discomfort. The third level is the breath that stays in place throughout the body. It doesn't flow here or there. The breath sensations that used to flow up and down the body stop flowing. The sensations that used to run to the front or the back stop running. Everything stops and is still. The fourth level is the breath that gives rise to a sense of coolness and light. The fifth level is the really refined breath, so refined that it's like atoms. It can penetrate the entire world. Its power is very fast and strong. The most refined level of awareness, which is like atoms, has the same sort of power as an atomic bomb buried underground that can explode people and animals to smithereens. When the refined mind is buried in the breath, it can explode people and animals to smithereens, too. What this means is that when the mind reaches this level of refinement, its sense of self and other disappears without a trace. It lets go of its attachments to body and self, people, and beings. This is why we say that it's like an atomic bomb that can explode people and animals to smithereens. The Skills of Yohanna Momentary concentration is like a house roofed with thatch, its posts are made out of softwood. Momentary concentration isn't Yohanna. Threshold concentration is like a house made out of hardwood with a tile roof. Fixed penetration is like an immovable concrete building. This is where we become one in a single preoccupation on the single or direct path, Ikeyan Omega. It's like sitting alone in a chair or lying alone on a bed, without anyone trying to come and take up our space, or like being alone in a room without anyone else coming in to disturb us. When we're alone in a room, we can be at our ease. We can even take off our clothes if we like. We can behave with good manners or bad, and no one will complain. This is why a mind with Yohanna as its dwelling can be at its ease. It has a deep well so that it can get plenty of water to the point where it can drop directed thought and evaluation, leaving nothing but pleasure. This is where feeling becomes your frame of reference, Vedananupasana Satipatthana. The body feels full. All four properties earth, water, fire, and wind feel full. When the mind feels full in this way, nothing is lacking. That's rapture. You don't want any more of the four properties. When the mind soaks for a long time in this sense of rapture, it's like something you've soaked in water for a long time, the water is bound to permeate it to a point of saturation. This sense of rapture is the second level of Yohanna. When the sense of rapture begins to move, you don't feel at ease in the same way as when a boat begins to sway you want to get back on land. So once rapture fills the body, you let go of it, leaving nothing but pleasure and singleness of preoccupation. When the mind has soaked itself in pleasure to a point of saturation, it lets go, leaving an empty sense of equanimity. When the mind is really empty, it feels spacious and light. The more it soaks in equanimity, the more still it gets, giving rise to an inner sense of light. When the light is really intense you arrive at right mindfulness. Directed thought focusing on the breath without getting distracted is like planting a tree. Evaluation is like loosening the soil around the roots, giving it fertilizer, and watering it from the roots to the topmost branches. The body, which can be compared to the soil, will soften, allowing the fertilizer and water to penetrate down to the roots. Rapture is like the trees being fresh and green and bursting into bloom. There are five kinds of rapture, 1, an unusual sense of heaviness or lightness in the body, 2, a sense of the body floating, 3, a sense of coolness or heat, 4, a sense of thrill passing over the surface of the body, 5, the body beginning to sway. Pleasure means stillness of body and mind, free from hindrances. Singleness of preoccupation means being neutral toward other things, perfectly still in a single preoccupation. This is what the Buddha was referring to when he said that concentration matured with virtue is of great benefit, great rewards. Directed thought is like standing and looking out a window. Whoever walks past, we know, but we don't call out to them or turn to look after them as they walk down the road. We simply stand perfectly still at the window. Directed thought and evaluation applied to the breath are like car mechanics. The mind is like the head mechanic. When we drive our car, 
we have to be observant and keep checking all the mechanical parts such as the steering wheel, the springs, the tires, the gas line to see if anything is wearing out or not working properly. If we find that anything is not working properly, we have to fix it immediately. That way the car will take us safely to our destination. When you practice concentration, you have to be observant, checking your breath to see whether or not it's coming in smoothly, and adjusting it to make it comfortable. Your concentration will then progress step by step and ultimately take you to the transcendent. When people criticize you, saying that you're in a blind state of yahana, it's still better than having no yahana to be in. And if they say that you're like a baby chick that hasn't come out of its egg, that's okay, too. When a baby chick is still in the egg, no hawk can swoop down on it and catch it. When it comes out of the egg is when it becomes prey. They may say that you're sitting in stump concentration, but don't pay them any mind because stumps can have their uses. Sometimes they grow new branches, with tender leaves you can eat. But if the stump catches fire and burns to a crisp, that's no good at all. As we keep training the mind, it keeps getting more and more mature, more tempered and sharp, able to cut right through anything at all. Like a knife that we always keep sharpening, there's no way it can not become sharp. So we should keep at the practice in the same way that we sharpen a knife. If any part of the body or mind isn't in good shape, we keep adjusting it until we get good results. When good results arise, we'll be in a state of right concentration. The mind will be firmly established in the present, in a state of singleness of preoccupation. We'll gain power both in body and mind. Power in body means that wherever there are pains, we can adjust the properties of earth, water, fire and wind to give rise to a sense of comfort, in the same way that we trim a tree. If any branches are broken or rotten, we cut them away and graft on new branches. If the new ones break, we graft on more new ones. We keep on doing this until the tree is healthy and strong. Making the mind still is good for two things, suppressing and cutting. If we can't yet cut, we can still suppress. Suppressing means that there are defilements in the mind but we don't let them flare up into action. We keep them in line. Cutting means that we don't even let them arise. In putting the mind in shape we have to be observant to see what things need correcting, what things need fostering, what things need letting go. If you do nothing but correcting, it won't work. The same holds true for just letting go. We do whatever the practice requires. When the mind is in concentration, it doesn't get distracted by any thoughts that come passing by. It's like a person entirely focused on his work, if anyone walks by and tries to strike up a conversation, he doesn't want to respond or even look up from his work. In the same way, when the mind has really cut away its outside preoccupations, it's bound to stay entirely in the object of its meditation. The mind full of defilements is like salt water in the ocean. You have to use a lot of directed thought and evaluation to filter and distill the mind to the point where the salt water turns into rain water. People in the world are like people floating in boats in the middle of the sea when it's filled with waves and monsoon winds. Some people are so far out that they can't even see land. Some are bobbing up and down, sometimes able to see land and sometimes not. This stands for people who are meditating Budo. Others are beginning to come into harbor where they can see fish traps, sailboats, and the green trees on the coast. Some have swum in so far that they're almost ashore but not quite. As for the Buddha, he's like someone who has reached the shore and is standing on the land, free from every kind of danger. He sees all the perils that human beings are subject to, and so he feels compassion for us, trying to help us reach the shore and escape from the dangers at sea. This is why he teaches us to develop generosity, virtue, and meditation, which are things that are going to pull us safely to solid ground. When we develop the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha within ourselves, we won't have to suffer. We make the mind into Dhamma, and the various defilements that spoil it will disappear. This is how we can escape from the sea. Once we get on land we can have lots of fun, because there are a lot of things we never saw at sea. It's like when we come into the mouth of the Chao Freya River, where there are marsh trees and fresh green plants. 
we become enchanted and keep walking further inland to Sukhumvit Road. There we see bicycles and trucks and jeeps and pretty automobiles of different colors. This gets us even more excited, and some of us get smitten with what we see on land. In other words, we fall for the visions and signs that come in meditation. For instance, we may begin to remember previous lifetimes. If we remember bad things, we become sad. If we remember good things, we get happy. This turns into craving, the desire to be this or that, and some people get really deluded, thinking that they actually are the things they see. If our discernment isn't strong enough, then whatever we see will turn into the corruptions of insight, vipassanupakalisa, like people who get all excited the first time they see a car. They go running to the car, wanting to ride in it, wanting to drive it, but without looking right or left or stopping to take note of anything. They run right out into the middle of the road, get run over, and either die or break an arm or a leg. After all the trouble they went to in order to get out of the sea, they get deluded and put themselves in danger all over again. But if our discernment is strong enough, whatever we see will turn into noble treasures, Aryadhana. If we see a forest of marsh tress, we can put them to use. We can cut them into firewood to use ourselves or sell in the market. If the land is a tangle of weeds, we can clear it and turn it into fields. If we don't let it lie fallow, it's sure to yield crops. Falling for visions is also called skewed perception. The right way to act when you see a vision is to remember to evaluate it and then let it go in line with its true nature. Don't latch on to what you see, because all things are inconstant. If you are born poor, you suffer from your desire to be rich. If you are born rich, you suffer in looking after your possessions, afraid that they'll wear out, afraid that you'll get cheated out of them, afraid that thieves will break in and steal them. There's nothing certain or dependable at all. The same holds true with visions. So whatever you see, you have to let it go in line with its nature. Leave the trees in the forest, the grass in the meadows, and the rice in the fields. If you can do this, you can be at your ease, because you know what it's like on land, what it's like in the water, when to get in and when to get out. Once you're skilled, you can travel on water or land, at your ease in every way. You can go forward or back without any obstacles. This is called Lokavadu, knowing the world. You can stay with what you know, but you're not stuck on it. You can live in the ocean without drowning. You can live in the world without getting sunk in the world like a lotus leaf in the water, the water doesn't seep into the leaf at all. When you're true in what you do, your work will succeed in every way. For instance, if you're true in observing the precepts, your precepts will get results. If you're true in practicing concentration, your concentration will get results. If you're true in developing discernment, your discernment will get results. The reason we don't see results is because we're not true in what we do. Only five precepts, and yet we can't catch them by the head or the tail. And when this is the case, how can we ever hope to make a living at anything? Only four concentrations the four stages of Yahana and yet we keep groping around and can't find them. There are people who can manage farms covering hundreds and thousands of acres, and yet we can't even manage just four concentrations. Isn't that embarrassing? If we aren't true to the Buddha's teachings in our thoughts and actions, the results of our not being true will keep pushing us further and further away from the Dhamma. We'll have to be hungry and suffer in various ways. For this reason, the Buddha taught us to be true in whatever we do. When we're true in this way, then even though we live in the world, we can be at our ease. We know how to flush the suffering out of our heart, to the point where the body feels comfortable in every part. Peace and calm depend on the heart's having enough and being full. If the heart is full, external fires won't be able to seep into it. When the body is filled with mindfulness, then where will there be anything lacking in the heart? This is why, if we want to be full, we have to make an effort at developing our meditation as much as possible. Rapture will then arise. When rapture arises, we're not stuck on it because we realize that it's undependable. It eventually has to fade away. So we let go of the rapture. When we let go of the rapture, 
the mind is at ease in a sense of pleasure. This sense of pleasure and ease is much more refined and profound than rapture, with none of its active symptoms. Rapture is like a person who's pleased by something and so shows it by smiling or laughing. As for pleasure, it doesn't have any external signs. It's hidden in the heart, as when a person is very rich but doesn't show his wealth in any way that people would catch on. This pleasure is what calms the mind. If it were to show itself externally, it wouldn't serve any purpose. Pleasure of this sort can cool the heart and give it respite, and this is what leads to stillness and peace. When the mind is at peace, it grows bright and clear, just like a sea without any waves, you can see the boats ten miles away. Whatever comes from the north, south, east, or west, you can see it clearly without having to use a spyglass. Our vision goes out further than normal. This is how we give rise to vipassan, or the insight that allows us to know and see the truths of the world. If we have a coconut, crack it open, and eat the flesh, it fills us up only once. If we forego eating it and plant it in the ground until it grows into a tree with more coconuts, then take those coconuts and plant them, eventually we'll become coconut plantation millionaires. If we get money and simply stash it away, it won't serve any purpose, and the day will come when it's no longer safe. So we have to find the right place to put it, by making donations to the religion. That's when it will give rise to further results. If the mind goes no further than concentration, it simply gets a sense of ease. We have to invest that stillness in giving rise to discernment. That's when we'll meet with the highest happiness. If the mind has a sense of inner fullness, then when we associate with other people they'll pick up on that sense of fullness as well. If we're miserable, then when we associate with other people we'll make them miserable, too. If we can develop the power of the mind, we can send thoughts of goodwill to help lessen the sufferings of other people. But if we don't straighten ourselves out first, we can't really help anyone else, in the same way that a crazy person can't help another crazy person become sane. If we're on fire and other people are on fire, how can we help them? We have to put out our own fires first before we can help them cool down. We have to have before we can give.